Welcome, Ben Mama. The recent acquisition of Activision by Microsoft has got a lot of people talking about the company and its fascinating history, where it's credited as being the very first third-party publisher, having been formed by a group of disgruntled former Atari employees. But it's important to add that none of these original founders are still with the company, with the last having left in 1986. Ownership of the company had also changed hands multiple times over the years, meaning that they were only really Activision in name anyway. A lot like the modern Atari for that matter, that don't have any links to the original Sunnyvale based company other than the intellectual property they own. And there is actually a lot of examples of this in the video game industry. Companies that are very much still around but have changed ownership numerous times. Other notable examples include the likes of Codemasters, Electronic Arts, SNK and THQ. But there are very few software companies that still exist with the same ownership they had when they began, and outside of Ubisoft, I bet that most people would struggle to name even one. So in this video I'm going to be telling the stories of five such software companies, games developers and publishers that have been in continuous and consistent existence since the 1980s. All of these were once big names within the industry, either in the UK or America, and were responsible for many best-selling games all companies that most gamers don't realise are still very much active today. Now let's have a look at our five candidates, shall we? Rats are invading Krusty's Funhouse on NES, SNES and Genesis. Lead the varmints into traps and crasterize the little stinkers with help from Trapmaster Butt. <laughs> The name certainly isn't familiar to everyone, but Audiogenic remains one of the oldest still existing video game publishers in the world today. The Audiogenic story starts in 1975 with the Sun Studios in a sleepy village called Thiel in Berkshire, UK, best known for being the location of the Borrowers in the live action movie. This location was also notable in that at this time the vast majority of professional recording studios were still located in London. These studios were run by one Martin Maynard and amongst his clients were chart toppers such as the New Seekers and Van Morrison. Another interesting and ultimately very important facet of Sun Studios was that it also included its own tape reproduction plant. It was this facility that led them to a venture into the software industry. As the home computer market began to explode, the many small software companies in existence at the time were all looking for ways to produce their games in great volume and get them into retail. Audiogenic's first customer was none other than Commodore themselves, as they penned a deal with them to reproduce software for the new PET computer. This got Martin thinking, and he decided to fly over to California to try and secure deals to produce software for the next Commodore machine, the VIC-20. It wasn't long before more deals were struck with companies such as Cosme, Broderbund and Creative Software to master and distribute all their games in the UK. A move into hardware sales too with products like the Koala Pad and Entropro Quick Data Drive proved much less successful, and the losses suffered from these saw Martin reassess the future of the software division. This saw Audiogenic Software merge with another company who were very prominent in the UK Commodore scene too, Peter Calvers Supersoft. Although Peter would head up the new company, he chose to use the more well-known Audiogenic name and expand to produce games for non-Commodore systems too, having tremendous success with titles like Emily Hughes Soccer, Loops, Graham Gooch Cricket and Krusty's Super Fun House. In 1996 there was another re-evaluation of the company and Peter decided that the cost of developing and publishing new games had become too much. Audiogenic had already moved away from self-publishing games starting with the release of Rat Trap with Acclaim, which became Krusty's Super Fun House, and had also developed the Brian Lara games for Codemasters. The latter relationship had proved pretty fruitful, so Peter struck a deal to sell all his existing projects and studio to the Codys, retaining ownership of existing IP and the Audiogenic name. From this point forward, Audiogenic software would only exist for the licensing of legacy products as they do to this day. But this is where it gets really interesting, because despite merging his Audiogenic software company, Martin Maynard's music studio and reproduction plant continued to exist. This was subsequently be rebranded as Sounds Good Limited to avoid any confusion, with Maynard International as the parent company. But Martin wasn't quite done with video games, as longtime Audiogenic employee Daryl Steele 
who had chosen not to transfer over to the new company, persuaded him to have another go. This would result in the launch of budget label Top 10 Hits. If you recognise the name, that's because Daryl went on to become the marketing manager for Atari UK, and was a key figure for the company, responsible for launching the ST and Lynx in the UK, and the Jaguar across the whole of Europe. It was Daryl's involvement in running the Audiogenic Reproduction Facility that led him to working with Atari and eventually becoming their employee. Upon leaving for Atari, Top 10 Hits was shut down, but the music studio continued on. Sounds Good has since relocated to Merseyside, but still provides the host of audio and video services. This of course means that both sides of Audiogenic still exist in the present day, making them very unique in this list. One of the very few software houses to originate from the southwest of England, Jarrell was founded in 1983 by Robert White to produce games for the growing home computer market. The company went on to develop games for almost every 8-bit computer on the market in the UK, including the Oric 1, ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Atari 8-bit, BBC Micro, Acon Electron and Amstrad CPC. By far their biggest hit was Harrier Attack, that sold over 250,000 copies and was also bundled with the popular Amstrad CPC 464 computer, where it's still held in very high regard by its owners. They also had big success with Turbo Esprit, which is credited as a key influence on the Grand Theft Auto series and was possibly the earliest example of an open world driving game. Other hits for the company included the likes of Combat Lynx, Critical Mass, Scuba Dive, Jungle Trouble and Thanatos. But another game that deserves a special mention is Clive Townsend Saboteur, that has been recently resurrected for modern systems including the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Despite experiencing widespread success within the video game sector, in 1987 they decided to change direction to focus on producing games for the ever-growing financial services industry that had very much made the UK its home. With this they sold the vast majority of their back catalogue to Elite Systems, who coincidentally are also still going strong to this day, to be republished on the company's budget-priced Encore label. It's estimated over 1,000 advisors and brokers use the current Jarrell software, making them a very big player within their industry but I'd guess that very few of those users are even remotely aware of the company's entertainment-focused origins. Officially founded in 1991 by Chris Johnson, the story of Beyond Games started much like many others, with a kid learning to program on a computer at home, in this case the TRS-80. Feeling limited by the capabilities of the Radio Shack computer, it wasn't long before Chris upgraded to an Atari 800, and that's where his career really began, as he started to create proper games that he distributed locally. As 1983 came around, his homeland experienced a much talked about North American video game crash, and Chris put a hold on his plans to work in the industry full time. In the late 80s, Nintendo and Sega had risen from the console ashes to become the market leaders. As a proud owner of systems from both companies, Chris was dying to make games for them. He sent letters to both Sega and Nintendo in hopes of scoring a development system, but neither even bothered to reply. This might have put some people off, but Chris was so eager to make a career out of games, he returned to his first love, Atari. He had just become aware of their new handheld console, the Lynx, and was really interested. He bought one immediately and was totally blown away, and that was it. He just had to set his ideas alight on this advanced new technology. He immediately sent a letter to Atari asking for development details, and even though he didn't have an office or any employees, let alone any games on the market, Atari actually still replied. They said he could buy a development kit for around $1,000, and he was so excited he returned the paperwork with his cheque the very next day, and was playing with the dev kit just a week later. This eventually resulted in the release of Battle Wheels to critical acclaim, and with it his company Beyond Games became one of only a handful of officially licensed third party publishers for the Lynx. From here Beyond Games went from strength to strength, as they went on to develop games for the new 64-bit Atari Jaguar such as the excellent Ultra Vortec, and Atari was so impressed by their work that they handed them a contract to develop Alien vs Predator 2 for the console, though that ultimately went unreleased due to the sad demise of the Jaguar. Beyond Games moved on to develop games for other systems such as the Sony PlayStation, Sega Dreamcast and PC, amongst others, and carved a niche as a go-to developer for combat-based driving games. 
In the following years, the company saw two name changes. Firstly, to Smart Bomb Interactive, before transferring over to the current moniker Wildworks, where they have experienced tremendous success with children's MMO, Animal Jam, that is now the main focus of the company. They are still headed up by original founder Chris Johnson, with his very first employee, Clark Stacy, now operating in the role of CEO, and they're still in the same location of Salt Lake City, Utah. It's fair to say that Zeppelin games were very much a latecomer to the UK home computer market, not arriving on the scene until 1987. But despite this, they quickly made a mark in the budget games market with titles like Blinky's Scary School, Zybex, Draconus, Ninja Commando, Ed the Duck and Jockey Wilson Darts. What makes this most surprising is that founder Brian Jobling had only just turned 17 when the company was first registered. One of the keys to the company's success was how they continued to support 8-bit computers like the ZX Spectrum and Atari 8-bit long after their rivals had deemed them no longer commercially viable. With the latter, they also deserve special praise for republishing several games by leading Polish software publisher LK Avalon, like Mission Shark and Fred, that might not have otherwise reached Western audiences. They managed to make a successful move into publishing games for 16-bit computers like the Atari ST, PC and Commodore Amiga, before they transitioned into a console developer, producing best-selling titles such as Micro Machines and Pete Sampras Tennis for Codemasters. They also signed up as one of the very first third-party publishers the Atari Jaguar, though their only announced title, Centre Court Tennis, ultimately went unreleased. In 1994, the company made a short-lived name change to Merit Studios Europe, before another rebranding exercise in 1996 as they became Eutechnics, the name they still use in the present day. Under this moniker, they have specialised in developing racing games including titles like Le Mans 24 Hour, NASCAR, F1 Grand Prix, Fast and Furious and Big Mother Truckers. Despite not being a hugely successful company back in the day, Color Dreams have achieved almost legendary status in the present one, mainly thanks to their games being featured in numerous episodes of the ever-popular Angry Video Game Nerd YouTube series. Color Dreams was founded back in 1988 by Dan Lawton and was one of the very first companies to work out a way to bypass the Nintendo Entertainment System's lockout chip. This led to them producing a stream of unlicensed third-party games for the NES that were usually distributed via mail order and independent stores that hadn't already signed a draconian distribution agreement with Nintendo, unlike all the larger chains who couldn't risk the big end's legal wrath. After seeing some success through these channels, Color Dreams applied to be an official third-party developer for both the Atari Lynx and Sega Genesis, hoping to expand into new markets and reach more people. Despite advertising a number of games for both consoles, including most notably an officially licensed game based on the classic horror movie Hellraiser, only one was ever released, Crystal Minds 2 for the Atari Lynx. The main reason for this was the company's change of direction that started with a rename to Wisdom Tree, this came about because they saw a new gap in the market that they felt could be exploited, and that was religious games. Such products had already been released on home computers and had seen a lot of success, but nobody had attempted the same with consoles. The rebranded company's first release was Bible Adventures for the NES, a 3-in-1 multi-cart that borrowed several gameplay elements found in the American version of Super Mario Bros. 2. These were applied to three different Bible stories, Noah collecting animals for the Ark, saving baby Moses from the Pharaoh's men and reenacting the story of David and Goliath. The game reportedly sold over 350,000 copies, thus vindicating the decision to change direction and give them the impetus to continue. Wisdom Tree then expanded into making religious games for other systems too, including the PC, Apple Mac, Game Boy and Super Nintendo, perhaps most notably in the form of Super Noah's Ark 3D for the SNES an illegal hack of Wolfenstein 3D that required an official cartridge to be plugged into the top of it to get past the system BIOS. They continued to release new games right up until 1996, with the last game being developed by the company being an FPS for the PC called Hellraiser, seemingly unrelated to the movie-based games they had previously announced some years before. However, after seeing the huge success of Doom, they decided that they couldn't compete and made the decision to cease development of all new games, leaving Hellraiser unreleased. The company was never closed down, however, and maintained an active presence right up until the present day, 
as well as selling existing PC games through their own website, they began to look back at their own legacy and in 2010 they made all Wisdom Tree NES games available through the official Wisdom Tree website in the arcade section via a Java based NES emulator. In 2013, new retro games publisher Pico Interactive acquired the rights from Wisdom Tree to release actual cart reprints of various Wisdom Tree games, including the rare and sought after Super Noah's Ark 3D. And then, in the summer of 2014, retro gaming website Stone Age Gamer began selling licensed t shirts based on numerous Wisdom Tree properties, including Bible Buffet, Sunday Fun Day, Super Noah's Ark 3D, and Exodus. In 2015, a remastered PC port of Super Noah's Ark 3D was released on Steam, and in June 2016 they teamed up with Pico Interactive again to launch a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter for Wisdom Tree Returns, with arcade plug and play. It was successfully funded with over $25,000 pledged by nearly 350 backers. Color Dreams is the leader in non-infringing Nintendo compatible game cartridges. Our advanced technology game packs provide hours of high quality home entertainment. Backed by multi-million dollar financing, our manufacturing facility can produce whatever quantity is required to meet your demand. Our games are supported by national advertising in all major video game magazines to guarantee that the high demand for our products continues. Color Dreams has taken preventative measures against patent infringement from the start. Our game cartridges are designed with the help of a legal team consisting of its own counsel as well as outside patent counsel to ensure that the games are infringement free. From the cartridge case design to our lockout chip, you can see it is the goal of Color Dreams to engineer around rather than challenge patented technology. The fact that Nintendo has not sued Color Dreams is perhaps your best assurance that our games are infringement free. And that runs up the story of five video game companies that you didn't know still existed. Can you think of any other developers or software houses that fit this criteria? And which of these stories did you find the most interesting and why? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons to continue to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Ozzy B, D. Vaughan, Dos Gamer Man, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to a host of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.